So I'm Michael Strong, founder of Expanse Online. This is When School's Not Working. Expanse is a secondary, well, ages 10 and up program where we help you discover and develop your child's unique genius. And before introducing our guest, Joshua Papineau, I will let Matt Barnes introduce himself and then Kath. Hey, good evening. Great to see you, jo uh, Joshua. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm Matt Barnes. I uh, am a co-founder of an organization called The Education Game. What we do is we help parents who, uh, who like us, we believe that, uh, that normal is broken in school. And so we want weird to be what parents actually pursue because weird means the child is going to uh, be able to think for themselves. They're gonna be able to pursue their own interests and curiosities uh, and they won't be controlled by the structures that are in typical schools. So we help parents and learners understand how to do that. Uh, and it's great to meet you this afternoon. Great. And uh, I'm Catherine Fraze. I'm the founder of Workspace Education, uh, a 32,000 square foot, really a uh, makerspace and place for authentic creative self-expression uh, where families can go to create the education they need for their children. And uh, also 100 Roads, which is our research and development company that is really interested in co-learning and, and helping people understand how they can uh, work together to create the education they need for their children. So back to you, Michael. Terrific, thank you, Pat. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that I really love about Josh and his story is that, you know, I talk about identify and develop your child's genius. And I think a lot of parents, if your kid is not already, you know, getting these incredible academic scores, they think, what, genius? But Josh had a passion, and I'll let you speak to this, Josh, later on, a passion for sound and music and voice. And coming out of Summerhill, the original self-directed education, which was radically unstructured, he managed to create, I think, an amazing, diverse, fascinating career based on his passions. And so rather than, um, you know, do a spoiler alert, uh, or spoil the whole show, I'm gonna leave you with suspense as Josh tells you first about his experience at Summerhill and then how his passion led to, I think, one of the most original careers I've ever heard of. And so, Josh, if I can uh, interrupt, Joshua, could you just frame Summerhill? Because a lot of folks have no idea what Summerhill is and then go into your experience there. Yes, um, well, thank you all for asking me to be here. It's a pleasure. Summerhill really is the pioneer in sort of alternative education. Uh, it's now been going 100 years. And it was started by a Scotsman, A.S. Neal, Alexander Sutherland Neal, who was a teacher. He, he was trained to be a teacher in school where he was supposed to whip the kids into submission and, you know, learning and all. And he was very unhappy with that. So he just began to, he just didn't believe that that worked. The kids were unhappy. Everybody was unhappy. Nobody was able to excel at anything particularly. And so through his uh, sort of study and association with other people like Rudolf Steiner and various people like that, he just kind of moved in the direction of uh, freedom, freedom for kids. And he started this school, Summerhill, again, a hundred years ago when this kind of thing was really unheard of. And so Summerhill has been running continuously for a hundred years. It's never stopped. It's currently the headmaster is now his daughter. And um, basically Summerhill is a boarding school, which is already an advantage because it's a 24 hour environment, right? So kids are not moving from one sort of environment at home to another environment or atmosphere in the school. And the essential tenet of Summerhill is that give kids freedom and they will develop in the most optimum way for their happiness and fulfillment. And so I'm gonna underline their happiness and fulfillment, not necessarily the happiness of the societal structures about them or their parents or anyone else, because ultimately, you know, a happy, child can turn into a happy, healthy adult, which is probably optimum for society. So the way Summerhill is structured, again, it's a boarding school and it's small. When I was there, and it's probably similar, there were only about 60 students. 
So everybody intimately knows everybody else. It was from ages. We had people four years old up to the equivalent of high school graduation. This was in England, though, which is a little bit of a different system in England. They have the uh, GCEs, the, the, you know, exams. But it's basically it would be from four years old to what we would probably call, you know, high school graduation. So mm -hmm. at Summerhill, there are lessons in every typical subject that are necessary, quote, unquote, I put that in quotes, necessary. They're offered every day. There's a, there's a regular curriculum. However, the kids make their own choice about whether they want to go or not. It's completely 100% optional whether the kids go to lessons or not. So in addition to that, so they're offered every day, same schedule, but it's up to the children to go. There's no pressure to go or not go. Um, in addition, as a community, the community basically makes the rules that they live by. So we have, we had and have meetings, right? Every, every Saturday, there would be the general meeting. And in the meeting, people would bring up, anybody could bring up something. There, there's a chairman of the meeting and a secretary to kind of make notes and, and keep track of things, sort of keep things organized. But anybody can bring up an issue they have. It can be an issue about some rules in the school, or often it can be between people, so-and-so is bullying me and they won't let me, you know, I mean, kids, right? People, there's a, this is a interactive human environment. So relationships, all this kind of stuff that happens between people is happening there, but people can bring up an issue, a problem, a complaint, anything. And then the whole community will discuss it and people will make proposals. You know, what do you propose? after it's been discussed, you know, and I mean, for instance, someone say, well, so-and-so is teasing me all the time and they won't leave me. And then someone will say, hey, they're the best of friends. I see them all the time, like holding hands and do it, you know, it's like, well, do you, well, yeah, you know, and, and so all this kind of sort of reality and truth and perspective can come out and then people will make proposals and then they're voted on by the entire community. And every person's vote from the four-year-old child up to when I was there, Neil, who was in his 80s, uh, had one vote, and then we would, you know, pass. We would pass a law or it would be voted down or whatever. So the point being, obviously, a four-year-old is not going to have as wide a perspective on life, reality, human relationships as, you know, older people, but to be in a situation where everybody's discussing and listening and there's this kind of general communication, which then allows the, even the little kids to have a say. Their vote matters as much as the headmasters, Neil's, the four-year-old kids vote matters. And just to sort of um, feel like you're being given this responsibility, it's something to take seriously. And so you, this is how you develop responsibility. In a traditional situation, and I'm, I'm talking black and white here, of course, basically adults make the rules, kids have to follow. Adults, society, whatever structures, kids have to follow. It's basically like they're just forced. You just have to do this. You know, this is what you have to do. Don't give me any guff, you know, and it's just this is the way it is or some variation of that type of energetic structure uh, doesn't recognize the autonomy and power that every human being has, mm -hmm. however developed or less developed. And so giving this, having this environment where you're giving kids this responsibility actually teaches them to be responsible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so basically, in a nutshell, Neil, the founder, his um, sort of goal, he would put the emotions come before the intellect, basically. You really, you know, have to understand emotions and become emotionally mature. And that the intellect, you know, 
really can catch up at any time. We're smart people. But if the emotions are stunted and you're not, you're not able to function emotionally in a, in a sort of mature way, then you're never going to be happy. You're never going to contribute in a really sort of beautiful, meaning way, meaningful way to society. So it was really, that was the priority because you can always catch up with academics when you're ready and when you want to. So that was the kind of thing. And he, his, his famous catchphrase was, I would rather graduate a happy dustman. That's what they call a garbage collector. And a happy dustman than a neurotic prime minister. Wow. That was one of his little uh, catchphrases. Wow. And so that was the basic sort of idea. Wow. You know, again, if, Michael, can I jump in real quick? Please, please go for it. Yeah. So, you know, as a parent, um, I want to believe you. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I actually do believe you, but I, I'm going backwards in time and going, gosh, if someone had said this to me 10 years ago, I would have laughed them out of the room. I would have called them crazy, whatever. Um, like, what's your, what's your best argument in terms of like trying to convince me 10 years ago that the, the hyper control model that I was really buying into the, the control model really that every s traditional school is founded upon that that doesn't work. I mean, can, can you kind of speak to uh, the risks associated with continuing that model at all or uh, maybe from well, your own experience? Well, there's a, different ways you can look at that. But if I kind of reduce it to a really simple idea, which is Nobody wants to be told what to do. That's right. You know, and no matter what age you are, if you say you have to do this, I believe that there's an automatic rejection of that. It's like, no, you can't force me to do that. And of course, in our society, we do force the kids to do that. But internally, in a child, you know, if you're saying, you know, you know, you have to do this, there's some part of any human being. It's just sort of we want to have the freedom to make our own choices, whatever it is. You have to do that. And so there's a part that goes, no. And that is going to really get in the way of them doing those things that they have to do anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said that that. You know, when you sort of address the emotions and the maturity, of the kid, then the academics, you know, are, are simple. When the yeah. child is ready and wants to do it, and of course, that also comes back to the question of should education be a process of making everybody learn exactly the same thing? Is that necessary and useful for society at large? Yes, we all need to read. And write. And at Summerhill, you got some young kids and who showed up who having a lot of problems reading and writing. And, and maybe that's like, wow, I don't have to do it now. I'm in Summerhill. I can do whatever I want. And it's like, yeah, okay, no, you don't have to do it. And then the day comes, you know, like lunch, you know, we had a chalkboard with various things up there. And the kid finally gets tired of asking, what does that say? What's for lunch? What are my choices? You know, and then there's sort of a natural it's like, I'm ready to read. I want to know what that says. Yeah. And if you are ready and you want to do something, you can just go so much faster than yeah. you can if, whether consciously or unconsciously, you are resisting just people forcing you. And the problem, the thing that's so weird about that is even if it's something that you actually probably would love to do and might really be wanting to do if someone says you have to do it there's a part that says no i don't right you know and how much does that get in the way of your forward right. motion so there right. were people at Summerhill who just were there till they were god 11 and they never learned to read and write and then they just went oh my gosh this is boring it's more fun to read and write because you can do more stuff and they finally get that and then like six months they're bam fluent because right. they wanted to do it right right well, and I have teenagers, so um, everything you're saying, 100% true. <laughs> if you try to <laughs> tell a teenager to do anything, it's going to be resistance. So it's, uh, I, I, I have come full circle on this deal, and I appreciate you helping me and hopefully other parents kind of realize this, this heavy pressure actually has some real downsides. So thank you. 
I, I will add, oh, Michael, you want to go? You want I was to just going to say, just to be, Lydia, you can add what you're going to do, but then I would be interested in your personal experience there. Did you goof off the whole time? Did you pursue things? Um, yeah. <laughs> so after you add whatever, let's hear about your personal experience as a student there. Well, first of all, I just want to, before I do that, I just want to say that this then relates to the idea of should everybody be studying the same thing. I was just, just today I was talking to someone, this woman who I go through for a certain kind of incredible physical therapy. And I was mentioning that I was going to come on tonight and she didn't know about Summer Hill. I told her a little bit about it. And she said, oh, well, I had the opposite. I went to a strict Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, and she said, I was a, still a, a free thinker, but you know, these people were, they were really strict, but they were fair. So I was able to kind of make the best of it. The other kids thought I was weird because I didn't do all the stuff they did. And I came number two in my class. And I said, how did, they how did that make you feel? She said, oh, that made me feel really good. And then I said, how many people are there, were there in your class? She said, 50. And so my next question is, how did number 50 feel? Mm. And she said, oh, terrible. They probably dropped out. So what the, the reason I'm mentioning this now is that this system, I don't know how prevalent it is in schools these days. In some countries, it certainly is. I'm not certain here, but the whole concept of, of uh, ranking a class, one, two, three, four, five. So think about, again, what I want to talk about is sort of the psychological, emotional effect it has on children. And I believe that you know, everybody has some innate, quote unquote, genius, right? And of course, genius is born out of what you love to do. Because anything you love to do, you're going to do it. You want to do it. You want to do more. You want to learn more, right? And so that's how genius develops, because you're following a path that is effortless and is joyful and, and you want to do. So when you're put into a situation where everybody has to study the same thing, and then they are graded kind of against each other. Um, what happens is, especially like when you're, when you're too young to really know yourself and what's really going on, say that you're a person who loves to work with your hands, you know, and you can see that in a little child. This is a child who loves the Lego and is making himself and all the time, you know, and a, another child might like to write little stories and draw pictures and just all different sort of natural things that we do. And the kids are going to do what they love to do. But then you're in school. And everybody has to take math. Everybody has to do biology, sociology. And so the kid who loves to work with their hands and do all of this may not do very well in sociology or in one of those other things or vice versa, right? So if you have a ranking, one to 50 or one to 30 or whatever it is, and a child who may have a incredible aptitude for writing poems and just playing with language or like me playing with your voice and then you're forced to do math or something you don't like you don't feel good about you get a poor grade and then based on all of this everybody do the same thing you are ranked and when they tell you well you are number 46 you're not doing good enough you're you're stupid or whatever sort of value judgment the school or the society is going to label on that student who is number 46 or 50, which is basically your failure, right. you know, some version of that, right? And when you're a young person, when people are telling that to you, whether overtly or covertly, you know, you don't have the, the sense of self and judgment to say, hey, screw you. I know who I am. You know, and so you take that in and then you start, it, it spreads through your entire being and you think, I am a failure. Not just, I'm no good at math, but I am brilliant at, at making funny little poems, mm -hmm. you know? And so it colors, your, it colors your whole sort of identity and you start seeing yourself as failure, less than, not able to. And then that, of course, is going to create a drag and, sure. you know, make I would describe it as forward. child abuse. 
I think it's a form of child abuse. And sadly, it's a, you know, it's a systematic form of child abuse across our society. And I think we, a certain percentage of the students are overwhelmed with shame and humiliation because of years of this. And I think a really significant amount of the dysfunction, crime, uh, in a variety of ways, mental health are all due to the systematic child abuse uh, where, it, you know, especially when there's that kind of a hierarchy. So no you're doubt. preaching to the choir. No doubt. So more about you, your experience there. Um, at Summerhill, right? Uh, at Summerhill, mm -hmm. um, well, I was not you know, it's quite different people at different ages when they come, you know, I didn't go there till I was uh, just about to turn 12. So I already, you know, could read and write. I mean, some kids would come there at four, some people would come at others. Generally, Neil wouldn't take anybody over about the age of 12, because it's like, they're already messed up, too messed mm -hmm. up. And, you know, even though people would read somewhere and they think, ah, oh, this place to send my kid who's completely screwed up, Neil would just do his best to say this is not a school for problem children you mm. know and of course parents would lie and say oh no my child is the sweetest thing you've ever seen and they'd come and they'd be a complete terror and we'd have to deal with it but um basically my sister had gone a year earlier we were living in asia i can go back to that but, but she was in a convent school that she didn't like she went she read about Summerhill and basically wanted to go there and so she went there for a year and then she really demanded of my parents that they send my brother and I so I was almost 12 and my brother was uh, about nine when he we went um I did not I like studying I like learning and, and and kids do everybody does it's just you get to pick what interests you as opposed to doing stuff that doesn't interest you mm. so I don't think I had a the week we called it some of a breaking out period um, where kids would come and they just could not believe if they came as they often did from a really strict traditional school in which they could not fit in and they were having all these problems and they'd show up and they'd like what what you mean i don't have to do anything i mean i can just lie around all day well you can't lie in your bed and sleep all day no but you don't have to go to classes you don't have to do anything and kids were like wow this is great and so some of them would do that for a few days a few weeks a few months even a few terms and after after a while it's like well okay that's interesting now i want to do something you know right. and because they're kind of allowed to to then follow whatever their interest is and honestly human beings we're born with curiosity and desire and all of that and you know if you can allow that encourage that to flourish mm -hmm. um so i guess i've always been interested in stuff you know i was doing music i've always been doing music and i played guitar and i you know went to classes because i was old enough to know that Summerhill was a very unique situation and mm. at some point I was going to leave and go into the the big bad world and and so I would need to um you know take tests and uh you know get a quote unquote high school diploma and then I would go to college or something and so I knew that you know so it's, I I wanted to keep up with that but what's the most interesting about Summerhill is just the personal interaction and how you really have all these people of different ages, like this huge family all living together. Um, and how, again, of course, the adults are quite um, responsive and available for the kids. Um, I have a question, yeah. Uh, yeah. if you don't mind. Um, you know, I'm thinking that you had all this freedom, right? And a whole different authority sort of paradigm in Summerhill. Um, and is that something that stayed with you for the rest of your life? Like, did that like trans transfer into how you think about other institutions and how you can navigate those to get your needs met without following the traditional route? I'm not sure exactly what your question is about that. I well, mean, you know, just because you weren't so reliant on doing, you know, a very structured, you know, what they're telling me to do, right? So, 
you know, I, I see, you know, quite a lot of uh, children who have chosen alternative education and they do see the rules of other institutions, but they don't feel like they're necessarily have, you know, they're always looking for workarounds, like they don't assume that you just have to plot along on this little system because that's what the rule book says anymore that, you know, oh, they want to do this. Well, maybe they can go this way instead of just going through college. They seem to oh. be much more out of the box because they realize that they can do it differently and they have much more autonomy um, and control than they actually thought that they had over their lives. Well, certainly that's been a, a big theme and, and the path that my life has taken has been one of just following my muse. But nevertheless, I've still had to interact with you know, authority, institutions, all of that in one way or another. The difference is that if I make a choice, then it's my choice. It's like, okay, I want to go into this and I see this is how they, this is how they set it up and structure it. And I may think it's ridiculous, but if I want to participate in some way, I recognize what that is. And in other words, rather than just like, I'm going to fight against everything because that's kind of right. You know, I'm going to fight against that. That would be a distraction from what it is I want to. If I'm trying to actually get what I want out of it, then it's my choice. And I see, okay, so this guy's a real, uh, and this is a real, uh, but this is what I'm dealing with. And so I can come to it with a place of, from a place of personal power where I'm not knuckling down I am making a choice to participate because there is a larger gain that I wish to to have, right? And so it's more that um, it is still my choice. And if this means obeying some really ridiculous rules that I don't believe in, if it gets to the point and I decide, well, this is just, I don't want to do this anymore, then I won't do it, you know? And so I think it's just about, again, if you have enough a sense of yourself, you've been encouraged and grown up with the encouragement to believe in yourself and what you can do. And, and then you have a certain power which allows you to engage with whatever the structures are mm -hmm. on your own terms. And if this means I got to pretend to be a little cockroach for a little while in their little system, e -e 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 -e, if it's my choice and I'm then, you know, I could, I could handle it. I mean, I don't know if that exactly. I think what Kath was bringing up is another major fear of, of parents, which is if I raise my child in a way, manner that gives him so much autonomy and freedom, then he's going to be self-centered and, there, and therefore he won't be able to function within the larger society that's going to require him to you know, to make choices and to submit in, in sometimes to the structures that, that be. But what you're saying is that freedom gives you the opportunity to actually make conscious choices. I'm going to pursue X and the trade-off is I'm going to have to deal with this environment that's somewhat restrictive, but I'm going to pursue X. Uh, and so I'm going to do that. Is that, am I saying that accurately? Well, yeah, it's just, yeah. Um, I would actually quibble with the term self-centered because it's used in a negative way connotation. And I would say that it is not a negative connotation. That mm -hmm. if you don't have a sense of yourself, if the center, if you don't come out of a centered place, you know how we use a positive, I'm centered. What does that mean? That's a positive thing, right? That's very funny. Self-centered is not positive. Centered is, oh, that's wonderful. And centered just sure. means being within yourself, knowing who you are, having a sense of your boundaries. You know, I mean, there's a lot of nuance to that term but that's just funny i never thought that before yeah, <laughs> it's it. like being centered is a wonderful thing we all want to be centered because when you're so strung out outside of yourself what do they want what does he need what do they, you know then you lose yourself mm -hmm. and if you can be centered and come from that place you're self-centered yay <laughs> um, so so I don't know. I'm, I can I keep keep going. Yes, Michael. No, I mean, all of this is very cool. I, I love that. That's a, a new thought I'd never had before. But you know, going on with the theme of you followed your path, you you know discovered and developed your genius, 
Tell us about going from Summerhill and ultimately landing in Japan. Did you go to college? Did somebody tell you? How did you, and then how did you find work? You know, right, right. Okay, so I'll, you just want the basic, the uh, quick little life yeah, story. Yeah, first my little narrative there. Right. I was born in a little house on the prairie. No, I'm um, actually, I was a voiceover guy for many years, right? So that's physical control. You know, if you, you uh, as people get older, their voice, vocal cords don't quite work the same way and they end up having more, they're not as tight or taut, more air flows through it. And that's why you have a voice like this. This is kind of more voice air flowing through the vocal cords, which <clears throat> I'm doing at will, although I probably shouldn't do it too much. Um, so born in Washington, D.C., uh, went to kind of regular school. Uh, my father joined the Peace Corps and was posted in Malaysia. So we went to Malaysia when I was nine. We were there a couple of years and it was there that my sister was in a convent school that uh, she didn't like. And she somehow read about Summerhill and wrote a letter to Neil herself. Oh, I hate my school. I wish I could go. Uh, he got hundreds and thousands of letters from kids all over the world. I hate my school. I wish I could come to some room. And there happened to be a bed available for a girl her age in the coming up term. My father was out of the country at the time because he never would have let it happen. He had to, for the Peace Corps, he had to kind of bop, bop around a little bit. But my mother let her go. So they kind of set it up and it was too late for my father to, you know, stop it really. So she went for that year second year that we were in Malaysia and she basically leaned on them to send my brother and I to Summerhill. Mm. Uh, at the end of my father's term, he basically thought, well, okay. And after working for the government, he also kind of was, became a little more liberated 60s thing and he didn't want to work for the government anymore. So he decided to go, we would move to England and he would go to LSE, London School of Economics and get a degree in sociology, which was his way of not having a job you know, having fun. Um, and so we went to Summerhill, my brother and I, uh, at the same time. So then after Summerhill, blah, 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 blah. Uh, as I said, I, I recognized that I was going to need to, I wanted to get a, high, a proper high school diploma so that I could theoretically go to college. And so Summerhill, there were no transcripts, no grades, right? Nothing. But I had the teachers there. I was going regularly to classes, and I asked the teachers to sort of make me a transcript and sort of give me a grade, what, what they would have if it was a sort of traditional environment. Came back to Washington, D.C. Uh, I was able to find a private school that was sort of organized more on a college basis in that it wasn't a class in each subject every day, boom, boom, boom. You had basically like a class in each subject once a week, maybe twice a week, and the rest of the time, you studied, right? You did work yourself. And you went to, the, I went to the school every day, but a big kind of library rooms and spaces. And so it was sort of organized that way. And I was sort of put at my, I had just turned 16. I was put at halfway through my junior year. And I'm not bragging that I'm smart, but it's just like, I didn't want to stick around there very long. So somehow they let me do a year and a half of the work in six months. So I was able to graduate with the senior class that June or whenever people do to graduate. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was really starting to get into music a lot, you know, and really kind of wanted to do that. Um, but I, I applied and was accepted to Goddard College. You probably you familiar with Goddard College, oh, which was also in its time, a pretty radical, you know, educational institution in Vermont. Um, I can't remember how it was radical because everything felt normal to me, but Goddard was quite radical. Michael, do you know why Goddard was radical? I don't know why. Why was it? Why was it? I don't know. China. No, it's one of, those, one of those experiments, but yeah, one of those yeah. experiment colleges. Yeah. Right. And, and I mean, one of the things that Goddard did, which was experimental, was that um, you have three terms a year. And for one of the terms, you go off campus, you go somewhere and you get a job or you do something outside in the, in the real world to give you, you know, real life experience instead of just being in your thing. That was one of the things. Anyway, so I, I was at Goddard for, I don't know, a year, maybe two years. And then um, 
I dropped out because I just wanted to do music. You know, I was following uh, just what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, maybe that was naive, but I wasn't thinking that I was going to get a degree per se that would mean much in the fields that I was interested as a creative person. My mother, I'll just interject, uh, was a passionate artist her entire life from her babyhood up until the last days of her life. She pursued her art with a passion. Uh, when we were growing up, she would remind us that she wished she had never had children um, because encouraging if she knew herself right if she knew herself better she never would have had kids but that was at an age where you just that's what you did you know and so she would have at least she would have her quiet time is what was called where in the afternoon from like two to four she'd be in her studio a big sign on the door and it's like don't you dare knock on the door kids you know and she but she was a brilliant artist and so you know, in certain ways, not a traditional mother, but as an example of a passionate, committed, artistic person, I think was very powerful for mm. me on that level. So, um, you know, I dropped out of Goddard and I guess I met up with a guy and, you know, we were, had a little band. We went to California and we performed this, that, and the other, and, you know, coffee houses. I was writing songs from an early age. And then that kind of all fell apart and I went back to DC for a while. And then I decided, uh, eh, I think I want to go back to school. And um, then I applied to Bennington College in Vermont. And um, I was accepted there. Um, I was a couple years older than the, the people. I think they made me come in kind of as a freshman again, because Goddard Goddard uh, education was worth nothing in the straight world, <laughs> you know, the alternative thing. So I think I had to come in as a freshman. Maybe I came in as a first year, second year person, but I think I came in at the beginning again. And I was a couple years older than students there. And, you know, it was very interesting. And I still did music and they had all, you know, in those days they had a white music department and a black music department. And they were like, you know, it's very interesting. And anyway, I stayed there for a couple of years. And then, uh, you know, I wonder if I did everything again with the perspective I had now, whether I would make the same choices. But, um, you know, I was young and I just wanted to follow my, my dream path and I wanted to keep doing music. So I didn't want to go into debt either. Mm -hmm. That's an important element. When I went to Bennington, I paid a third, my father paid a third, and I got a scholarship for a third. Mm -hmm. But after two years, I was going to have to come up with a lot more money or something like that. And the idea of going into debt did not appeal to me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I dropped out of Bennington and went back to California and met another guy, a couple guys, and had a group and played music and all that stuff. And, and then um, basically... I guess I should make this faster. One day my father came out from the East Coast and we were having lunch and he said, you know, you're not doing anything. Ha ha, you know, and typical fatherly advice that I didn't want. You know, you know, why don't you go to Indonesia and study? Oh, I'd been studying Aikido as well, martial arts, you know, Aikido. And he said, why don't you go to Indonesia? Because I know someone who knows someone who knows someone who might know a ma martial arts master there and you could go and blah, blah, blah. And of course, because he loved Malaysia and Indonesia. It's the Balinesian culture, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, Pops, right. You know, stuff it. Um, but then I went home and I just thought to myself, well, what if I went, I was 27, I think, 27, 28. I said, what if I were to just go move to another country? You know, it was not scary because we had lived in Malaysia as a kid. I'd lived in, you know, England and traveled around. And it's just, oh, well, what would it, what would it be like if I went to another country? Where would I want to go? And rather than sort of make a list of pluses and minuses, it's sort of I opened my mind to the universe. And I know it's, it's cliche. It was like a lightning bolt struck me. Just boom, go to Japan. Hmm. Um, now, I'll say that we had gone through Japan to and from Malaysia. Going to Malaysia and then from Malaysia to England, we went overland. My father was loved to travel. So instead of getting on a flight from Kuala Lumpur to London, we went up 
from Malaysia, it's peninsula, right, through Thailand into Cambodia before the Khmer Rouge, when you could get in there, Angkor Wat, Vietnam, Taiwan, back to Japan. We took a boat across to the east coast of Russia and took the Trans-Siberian Railroad, what? which was right in the middle of the Cold War, all the way across Russia, um, and then into Sweden and Finland, Sweden, blah, 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 and went to, so we went that way. Um, yeah. So anyway, we were in Japan a second time, and on some level, it just must have resonated with me deeply. So it was boom, go to Japan. And within three months, I had packed up my life, sold my stuff, started studying Japanese, figured out, you know, how am I going to, where am I going? What am I going to do? And basically took off with a commitment to stay at least five years, hmm. no matter what happened, you know, because anything less sort of, I knew people there who would just come and like every week it's like, well, I'm having a good time. I'll stay. No, I'm not having a good time. I might go, you know, never fully committed, but I just said, I'm staying at least five years come hell or high water. And I did, which turned into 16 years and being a musician, I just sort of, I did gigs and played. And then I kind of fell into a group of people doing voiceovers. Hmm. And um, so I just, sort of kept doing that make made like demo tapes because i i can make funny voices you know whatever and um and uh playing and and gradually did more of that you know of all kinds japanese and english of course when i did japanese voiceovers they didn't want perfect japanese my japan my pronunciation is pretty good because this that's my thing right voice and sound and you know they'd come in okay read this script and it's like no, 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 no. You sound too good. Sound like an American. Gaijin is the word. It's like, I am an American. No, no. What they meant is sound bad. And so I'd have to kind of rough it up and sound bad, bad Japanese and stuff. But anyway, I just did all kinds of all stuff like that. And, um, you know, it was a lot of fun. So that was, so you, so that was your, that was your career path. I mean, you, you, that's what you did for 16 years, more or less, huh? Yes. And then, cool. and then uh, through another sort of completely unforeseen circumstances, uh, I ended up leaving and moving to New York. And that was also, I know Michael's interested in this little scenario, um, which frankly, I still can hardly understand myself. I mean, I was happy. I was making a decent living, doing work that I really enjoyed. I had friends. I really liked Japan and all of that. And my cousin who lived in New York City at the time was always saying, oh, you should move to New York. You move. And my grandmother, who I was very close to, lived in New York as well. And on my visit, she said, I'll find you a place. I'll find you an apartment here, you know, in New York. And in some weird semi-conscious flippant way, I went, yeah, yeah, all right, ha, ha. And um, so basically, long story short, she sent me a floor plan and said, okay, I found this really cute apartment in New York, but you got to bid on it in the next 24 hours. And it's like, what? I was just joking. But, you know, part of me obviously wasn't joking. And I knew if I told her uh, I wasn't serious, she would go, okay, well, forget it. I'm not going to look for you anymore. But she, I knew she had a talent for, for finding apartments. Um, so basically, uh, I just called a friend day and night opposite in Japan. I called a friend, just check, for, check it overnight. He said, he took a look and said, yeah, it's nice, small, but you know, you'll be cute. And I'm used to living in Japan where it's even smaller. And uh, so I bid on it and my bid was accepted. And then I was in hellacious torment for the next six months getting myself to leave Japan, mm. which because basically it was 50.5% leave and 49.5% stay. So to make this ever lengthening story short, um, I did force myself out of there. It was the hardest thing I ever did. I mean, mm. it was painful physically even. Um, I left, I moved to New York and I say it was like jumping off a cliff into the void. But underlying that was this belief or this feeling that I want to keep growing, mm. you know, and when you're in a situation where you know everything, you know how to operate, it's all comfortable, that's kind of 
you've just reached the limit. This is the parameters. This is who I am. If you put yourself in an unfamiliar situation that you're not, it's going to bring out of you. It's going to call by necessity out of you other abilities and just out of desperation. It's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, it, it will bring forth things and you will grow. So basically coming to New York where I had no idea, I didn't want to do the voiceover stuff again because really I'm not interested in selling toothpaste, excuse me, which is most of what it's about, you know, advertising and stuff. And I have no interest in that. So I wanted to stay connected with Japan. So what can I do to do that? And then I kind of just sort of realized, well, you know, the thing, Japanese people are smart, good educational system, but they have terrible pronunciation. Um, the sound aspect. They can read and write quite well, but their level of pronunciation is way below. So you have people who are incredibly well educated with every degree you can possibly have. They open their mouth and people go, what? What? Could you repeat that? Which is humiliating. Japan is a country based on shame, you know, control, top-down shame and stuff. And I just realized that given my background, first of all, as a voice person speaking Japanese, you know, English and as a creative person that I could figure out a way to really help them because I know how their mind works as well as their heart works. I know how the mind is putting all the stuff together. So just over a period of time, I mean, I got a few books to sort of learn the, the nomenclature of pronunciation, you know, okay, they talk about it, use this vocabulary. But then I just started working with people and just figuring out, seeing what they can do, what they can't do, understanding how the movements of the mouth, tongue, lips, jaw are different for English and Japanese. So, okay, so I can speak English and here's how the mouth moves. Here's what my tongue's doing when I speak Japanese. How can I describe in a way that they will understand how to make the changes of moving the tongue this way to that way? And so gradually just worked out and then a whole methodology to sort of present it in a way that they could understand instead of like, here's this little sound and here's this other little sound, a whole structure to an approach. And so I just, you know, kept doing that and got better and better at it. And as I got better and better, I loved it even more and kind of felt like, all right, this is really useful. And people would just be like, why couldn't I have learned this when I was a kid? And why aren't you teaching all the people in Japan, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I taught live in New York for a number of times. And then I created a uh, video course, 105 videos uh, of my complete method with Japanese subtitles. And I'm trying to you know, get that so the, people in the Japan. Method. The, you, don't you call it the Papano method? The Papano method. That's it. And um, I also, I also have a uh, singer's course, pronunciation for singers, because I am a singer and it's really fun. I mean, speech, there's a book, if you guys are interested, it's nothing to do with this exactly. It's called, This is the Voice. It came out just six months ago, maybe. It's an amazing book. This is the voice uh, by, that talks about every aspect of the voice and what it means and how it evolved. And if you think about it, before language, before vocabulary, anything, we are singing. You know, you're hearing your mother's voice when you're in the womb for two or three months before you're born. So you learn the rhythm and melody of your own language before you were born. They did a study this is, sorry, off topic, but it's so fascinating. They did a tough a study of newborn babies, German and French babies, and just completely newborn, and they recorded them crying, and then they analyzed their crying, and French babies cry in French, German babies cry in German. <laughs> There's a completely different melodic rhythmic feel. You know, Fran French is, <laughs> and the Germans are, <laughs> and the babies, that's how they're crying. <laughs> So that well, you so know, you know, before you're born, before you learn a single word, you're already making the music of your language, right? And so all these elements. Anyway, I find all that stuff incredibly fascinating. This book, <laughs> this is the voice, is amazing, just as an aside. So that's what I'm doing. I have a singer's class where I wrote 30 original songs, each one focusing on technique, so that they're practicing the technique, which is all part of my system, as they're singing these little original songs. 
So what comes up for me with all of this, and again, I, I love the story. Uh, it's just so cool. What comes up for me is, you know, these regular kids in a regular high school taking regular courses and they go to the, the college counselor or the uh, guidance counselor and the guidance counselor gives them a test and just says, what are your interests? And says, well, maybe you should be a welder or you should be an engineer or you should be, you know, a journalist or something. And there's all these checklists and they study colleges with checklists and all of this. And at no point is there a period where they discover their interests, they learn how to open new doors in their life and so forth. So when I hear you went to Summerhill and then, you know, play some music after uh, high school for a bit, a little bit of college, play some music. By the way, go to Japan for 16 years and become a voiceover actor. By the way, come to New York and create your own accent reduction method. And you just love sound and music through all of this. I think, how does the, you know, how many kids could have their own genius, could discover their own genius, but instead they're taking Algebra 2 and world history and English literature and the guidance counselor is saying, based on this study, you need to be, you know, X, Y, and Z. And then they're in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s and still doing jobs they hate and maybe not even very good at them. So I, I just loved kind of your story is, you know, this sort of 60s era, fall your bliss and sounds like it turned out pretty well. Well, I will circle this all around because I know we're, we can't go on forever to <sighs> what's really essential is the time. Well, first of all, parents, right? The first really primary relationship is the parents and the children. And our society is not really set up conducive to nurturing children the way that they really need to be and could be nurtured because just demands even in case of one parent or even both parents are out working all day, you know, that the time spent with your children from the very youngest age, just talking to them, being with them, being responsive to them and what their sort of natural, being a, uh, aware of what their natural inclinations are is so essential you know and i don't have an answer for this because people are really stressed i'll say society does not give near the amount of uh <laughs> rewards to teachers teachers should be we should be in a situation where teachers are paid much more and considered much more valuable you know the people who are actually spending the most time with the children man that's the most important job to creating the society, when there's a very low ratio or a high rate, whatever, low or high, you know, a poor ratio of teacher to students, then how can any student get the individual attention that is even going to allow them to explore, much less express who they are or who they could be, you know, and that could just be an inkling of just like, oh, that's, you know, the kid's just like, oh, that sounds interesting. And if a parent is like, oh, okay just to give engage with the children you know and treat them as human beings you know that's the thing about summerhill i mean sure adults know more than kids but on a uh, what do i say emotional energetic spiritual level an adult is no more su quote unquote superior or different from a child and so if you can be with a child however young on some empathetic level where you're kind of equal. I think that that is tremendously important, you know, in giving the kid a sense of their own, build up their own self-respect. What I say matters, what I think matters. And if you're in a context where it's like, shut up and do this, shut up and do that, then what happens, shut up is shut down. I just thought of that too. I never said that before. Shut up equals shut down, you know? And so, and once you, once people are shut down, it's really hard to, to wake up again, right? So, you know, you're talking about Matt, you know, teenagers and people, and then they're just like, uh, you know, and, and, and then of course, people who have been raised and shut down, obviously when they're in a position, all they want to do is shut down the generation that comes after them. Because how can they acknowledge, allow, tolerate, encourage the, the self-expression of this younger generation when they were shut down, 
Right. That's right. So Matt I think Barnes fundamentalism, doing... a lot of fundamentalism in whatever color you want to paint it, just comes from those people who were shut down and now all they want to do is shut down everybody else. Yeah. Well, when you because... don't know what to do, you do what you know, and that's unfortunately what happened to you. So it's, uh, I, I, will, I will mention one thing, Josh. One thing that really became clear is that it's a reminder that life is not linear. It never is, even though we try to pretend that it is in the school structure. You bounced around, you moved, you found the place, you found other places. That is what life actually looks like. And so being prepared to, to, to flex uh, is really the preparation of the early years. And it sounds like Summerhill gave that to you in some way um, and allowed you to continue flexing over the last, you know, many years. So, Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not the young kid I once was, but I'm still, there's a part of me that's still like, okay, it's not over. Right. What's the next adventure? There's going to be a, I hope there's going to be a mystery ahead of me, which I have no way of fathoming what it is or could be. And that's going to keep me, maybe it'll be death. Maybe that'll be the next mystery, but I sure, I sure hope I have a few other things before that. I mean, I would love for my course to reach all Japanese people and just elevate the entire education, but I just don't seem to have those big connections. And I don't know, but I get, but the, my students love me to death and they love, and they're just so grateful. And, you know, I make it fun. We're laughing, even though it's, it's hard, you're laughing. The other thing I would just say is reading, you know, and this is hard. I don't know how to address it with the whole social media and everybody's on these devices now, which just suck them away. And that, that would be a whole other topic of conversation. And we did not have that when I was a kid. At Summerhill, there was not, there was a TV, but again, based on the community voting on it, it came out once a week for a couple hours and everybody would crowd in this room who wanted to, and we would watch Top of the Pops. That was the, the countdown music show. Uh, uh, in England in the 60s. Oh my God, those songs, Procol Harum and then the Beatle, you know, and all of it. And the whole school, we'd be there watching it, but that was it. And then it was put away, you know, so there wasn't that kind of stuff. But reading, I just want to say that my sister had five kids. My sister and her husband at the time, he went to Summerhill too. They met at Summerhill. So they raised their kids with this kind of a thing. Her kids, they went to school, but they were also homeschooled some of the time. It was in and out and all around. And um, even a couple of her kids went for a little bit to Summerhill. But all of her children are geniuses in their own way. They're all incredibly creative, artistic, um, self- motivated people. Now, my niece's oldest, uh, my sister's oldest daughter had twins. And I mentioned this last time, those kids, they were reading to their children from like, you know, before they were born, they were reading to the kids. And it's the kids just loved to read. And so these little girls, my God, you could not it was hard to tear a book out of their hands. You know, we, they were living in country, you know, okay, we got to go into town on the dirt road, get in the car. And they're like reading, reading the back, put it down. Okay. We go, shall we go back reading, reading, reading. And uh, both of them now, they just turned 20. They both uh, have full scholarships, one to Harvard and the other to Radcliffe where they're in now with full scholarships and, you know, I just think like sort of the reading and again, the reading part of that also in the beginning is that bonding between parents and kids. And I don't know how to address sort of the structure of society that makes that really difficult for a lot of people, but that's kind of heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, so. Huge, huge. So one thing we uh, was, we're gonna do earlier, but um, just for a, a social media clip to help promote this, uh, Matt Barnes, do you want to ask the Matt Bar Barnes question and you can try to do a, a short response, Josh? The Matt Barnes question? Uh, no. what Here's it? my question. No, I, I'm going to ask you a question uh, and I want you to try to respond in one minute or less. All right. Uh -oh. so really uh -oh. tight. I know. I may not be good at this. Is this a series of questions? Just one question. And, the question and am I going to be shamed if I don't do it correctly? You, you, we may give you a letter grade. I'm, I'm old enough to just tell you guys to all, uh, if I don't like it, but, but I'll tell no, no, no. you. Like... Super easy. Just want to okay. get your thoughts. So if you could snap your fingers 
and change one thing about our educational system, what would it be? Go. Just more time to focus on each individual, you know, and so in a really genuine way so that the person has the, the chance and the freedom to begin to even look within themselves without the pressure that they probably had their whole life of like, if you don't do this, you're going to be a failure. If you don't get this degree, you're going to be a failure. You're not going to make enough money. You know, I mean, in our society, money is God, unfortunately. And so a lot of people are doing a lot of things out of fear because, and fear is the killer, you know, fear because I won't have enough money. And parents, of course, they're scared for their children. Parents are scared for their children, and that's why they're pushing them because it's like, don't do what I do or do what I do, you know, and make money so you can be secure and do all of that. And just if there was a way to take sort of money out of the equation and allow people to really sort of follow a path of heart and their own, whatever that may be. I think Neil always thought we would have a whole society filled with geniuses. Everybody's a genius if they were allowed to, but instead everybody's, you all got to be the same. And so everybody's mediocre, except for you guys, of course. Still working to find my genius. I'm, I'm delayed yeah. by 49 years, but I'll get there. Thank you, Joshua. That was great. Was that okay? That answer Very you got much me nervous so. there. <laughs> great of failing. All right. Well, well, thank you very much, Joshua Popano. Popano, Popano. Mama, yes, Papano. Papano. Yeah, Papano's best. Okay. okay. <laughs> what? Papano, um, what? We are. I said Papano's best. Whatever that means. That's right. <laughs> but, so send the Papano method to all of your friends, Japanese uh, and otherwise. Um, and we are out of time. But thank you so much, um, Joshua. When I don't want no spaghetti, don't want no greasy steak Cause eating western food was my last big mistake Don't want no chocolate ice cream, I've had enough of cheese From now on my cuisine is strictly Japanese Itadakimasu I want so ba 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 I want so ba ba who decide so give so ba 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 I need so ba ba on a guy I want so ba I want booty I want Archie Swimming inside of me I want so ba 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 I want so ba ba who decide So give so ba 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 I need so ba ba on a guy Boogie with moogie, shimmy with sashimi Chacha with chuka, gyoza gimme gimme Pogo with piban, wig with napto For all of these gigs I say arigato Oh tofu chova, you know that I'd go for a bowl full right now So give me tofu from chova, you know that I'd go for a bowl full And how? I want pepe I want ika Inside of me, I want tofu from Jova. You know that I go for a bowl full right now. So give me tofu from Jova. You know that I go for a bowl full and how? Fabulous fugu, beautiful pancha, dazzling daikon, wasabi I want ya. Elegant heavy, marvelous miso, glamorous gobo. How could it be so good, 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 good? Japanese food, 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 food. Pickled us, stewed, 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 makes me feel good. I want so ba 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 ba. I want so ba ba who decide. So give me so ba 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 ba. I need so ba ba on a guy. I used to think that I was rude to vocally enjoy my food, but over here a stylish dude can slurp, slurp, slurp with attitude. So now I'm in a happy mood Glad that I'm big and Japanese food Japanese food Sure tastes good Japanese food Japanese food Japanese food Japanese food